One of my favorite people is an author. He's a lecturer. He's an explorer. And he's here today. His name is L.A. Marzulli, and you are all of the above. Thank you, Gary. I appreciate that. <laughs> it's good to have you back. Great to be here. And we're going to be talking about uh, L.A.'s On the Trail of the Nephilim video. It's called The Mysterious Mound Builders. And L.A., I think you are on the trail of something that really needs to be pursued. The story has grown over the years. You have dug deeper and deeper into what I think is one of the great, if not the greatest, hidden story on planet Earth today. And that would be that there is a hidden history that is all over this planet. It goes from, from corner to corner. <laughs> you know what I mean by that? Yeah. And we're not talking flat Earth here. But it, it's global. It's everywhere. It's, it's in Africa. It's in the Middle East. It's in the New World. It's in Peru. It's in South America. It's found uh, off the coast of Japan in the, in the hidden pyramids there. It's, it's found in Russia. It's absolutely everywhere. And what we're looking at, this hidden history has been, in my opinion, deliberately obfuscated by the powers that be to keep the people at large from knowing and understanding that there is a supernatural worldview, there's a supernatural element which has been here before, has interacted with human beings, it still does today, but not like it did thousands of years ago. And the evidence of that is everywhere. The rebellion of Satan <clears throat> and the beings who followed him and came to earth and, and tried to establish a dynasty here in the ages uh, long before we began keeping time. Uh, they rebelled and their rebellion has had a maximum impact on the development of, of humankind because humankind was, was developed by God, Adam and Eve, uh, the covenant that uh, God made with Adam, the seed of the woman brought the Lord Jesus Christ with a message of salvation. You have two great stories. And the one about Jesus is being told less and less. The backstory about the encroachers, the people who tried to take over planet Earth, is not told at all. It's hidden, totally. It's completely hidden away, and yet it's there in plain sight if we know what to look for. And that's the whole point of a series, is to go into these places and look at them through a biblical lens. And in the film, just one example, when we, when we were at uh, the Great Serpent Mound, which is near Peebles, Ohio. <clears throat> and I've been there three different times now. Flew a drone over it, filmed there with our, our good friend Fritz Zimmerman. And that is an undulating serpent over the terrain. It's the largest serpent um, iconography on the planet. Mm -hmm. And it shows the serpent with its mouth open, agape, in the act of swallowing an egg. And I want you to think about that for a moment because we're going to show the trailer to L.A.'s uh, uh, DVD and then we're going to come back and talk about that serpent. As always, your DVDs are uh, dramatic, action-packed, contain tons of information. That serpent, Thank you. serpent mound. Uh, let's go in a little more deeply on that. 
Genesis 3.15, which is one of my, it's, it's really the, the scripture that I think, unless the church, unless we come to an understanding of that, then we have no idea when we get to Genesis 6, three chapters later, Tower of Babel, uh, Abraham and the Five Kings, destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, who are actually in the promised land when Joshua and Caleb get the mandate to go in and conquer those entities which are there, and that mandate is to wipe them all out, men, women, and children. Right. Something is going on, and it hails back the Genesis 3.15 narrative. And the setting, in my opinion, is in the garden. Adam and Eve are over here, the serpent, the shining one, the kosh is over there. And Jesus, the pre-incarnate Christ, is, is speaking to them. And he, fr- he addresses the serpent first and says, your seed, the serpent, will be at enmity, at war, with the seed of the woman. He, the offspring of of the woman, the seed of the woman will be Messiah. He will crush your head, you of a serpent, the offspring of a serpent will bruise his heel. It sets up the rest of the biblical narrative. And yet it's not really taught in churches and most people never come to grips with the idea of the sea war. And you brought this up in in one of the conferences that we did, Nephilim Mounds conferences. Your title was It's All About the Seed. And that got me thinking and really crystallized and focused like a laser on what my mission is because of what that lecture that you did. And so here is this ancient earthwork, and it's not small. It's very it's huge. It's huge, even to build the mound and to lay out the earthwork for the serpent. And this serpent it has its mouth open, and an oval, ovoid object is poised just before its mouth. It looks like it's trying to gobble something up, perhaps. But to me, it's epigrammatic of the seed of the woman, the serpent trying to destroy the seed of the woman. And how could that be uh, laid out in an earthwork near Peebles, Ohio, in the United States of America? And we drill down into this because the, the, the new signage that's there, and we talk about this in the film, the new signage insists that the Shawnee was were responsible, the Shawnee First Nation people were responsible for making this huge serpent, which by the way you can only see from the air. When you're down next to it, you don't know really what you're looking at. Mm-hmm. And even the two-story tower that they built in sort of strategic location, you can get a good view of it, but you still really don't see it. You put a drone up a hundred a couple hundred feet, which is what we did, right. all of a sudden it just pops out and you just go, oh my gosh, what is going on here? So the bottom line is the serpent <clears throat> the undulating serpent and the act of swallowing an egg, that's Genesis 3.15. And that was put there deliberately to show the prince of the power of the air, you know, that this is, this is his territory. The signage tells us the Shawnee built it, but Chief Joseph Riverwind, who comes in on the film, First Nation mm-hmm. Peace Chief, tells us that the Shawnee claim that they had nothing to do with the serpent mound. And we quote Chief Wallace of the Shawnee, who states this, that while we respected the mounds and and were their sort of caretakers, in no way do we claim responsibility that we built the Serpent Mound. I mean, this is from, so who do we believe? Do we believe the the new signage that a bunch of archaeologists and anthropologists insist the Shawnee built it? Or do we believe the Shawnee Peace Chief, who tells us that We had nothing to do with this. And we hear this over and over and over again. So we have two sets of truth. One, they both can't be right. Somebody is is manufacturing something towards a managed agenda. And I think um, that the archeologists, with all due respect, the anthropologists, academia, have an ax to grind. And we, we really drill down into this in the film, that there is an academic bias the film is The Mysterious Mound Builders, and there's something I want to go into at this point in time. In, in your explorations, you've done something that I'm not sure anyone else has ever done, and that is you've examined what it would take to build these incredible prehistoric mounds, and what kind of tools and so forth, because there's a common myth that those were built with hand tools. Now, when, when I was uh, with you in Newark, Ohio, and then you referred to, that, to the meeting that we put on, uh, I went out to the earthworks in Newark, Ohio, and I was blown away yeah, by yeah. how much it would, or what it would take, even if you had modern equipment, to move that much earth. Modern day archaeologists insist that Native Americans, First Nation people, thousands of years ago, took primitive tools, stone flint hose, or the shoulder bones of a deer, and created these, these hose, and used these implements, and they carted off baskets, one basket at a time, 
to build the mound. So we just take one mound, Poverty Point. It's the second largest mound in the United States. They estimate the tonnage of that to be 390,000 tons. Now, Cahokia is the largest mound, mm -hmm. well over 450,000 tons. But we went with the second largest mound, Poverty Point. The anthropologist, Rick Woodward, uh, comes on the film. We interview Rick. And uh, he knew a flint napper, mm -hmm. a man who, created, who creates these museum pieces, replicas. And so this guy took a, a piece of flint, which would be found in the area, and he, he, he created this beautiful primitive hoe, dating back four, 6,000 years, what have you. And we, we hired a fit laborer, went out near Poverty Point, the same type of a soil, and we filmed all this. And we timed how long it takes one guy to go into the ground with this hoe, and the hoe worked pretty well, gather up the soil with his hands. Instead of a deer skin, we used a, a metal bucket, and then carry the metal bucket, let's say 200 yards, to a dumping site. Well, we did the math on this. It's about 30 pounds per bucket. Mm -hmm. To get 390,000 tons, and I don't have the math in front of me, but basically what it, what it is, is 26 million 26 million single buckets of earth. Or if you were to take dump trucks and line them up back to back to back to back to back, it's 200 miles long of dump trucks. And the whole theory collapses of its own weight. This is just one mound. Then you've got Cahokia, you've got Miamisburg, you've got the 10,000 mounds in Ohio alone. There are so many mounds, Gary, that were, and many of them have been destroyed. But Squire and yes. Davis has a lot of them written down in the, in, in the 19th century and, and surveyed them. And, and thanks to them, we have at least records of some of them. 10,000 mounds in Ohio alone. Cahokia, 450,000 tons of earth, at least. The plaza, Cahokia, 45 acres, and it's almost dead level within two inches. How is all this possible? So we are looking, in my opinion, this, this idea of, of carting single buckets of earth and, 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 and somehow compacting it. We don't even know how they did that. The whole theory collapses. And we time this, and it takes roughly 16 minutes to move the, dig the earth and move it. So this is a hunter-gatherer civilization, allegedly. So if you, even if you've got 3,000 people, half of them are women and children, and now you've got 1,500 men, let's say, out of that, how many of them are old and can't work or young and can't work? Mm -hmm. So you've got this small little segment of the population, and, and archaeologists and anthropologists will tell us, well, it took hundreds of years to do these things. That's what they tell us. The cathedrals in Europe, some of them took over 100 years to build. But this is not the same civilization as what's over here. It's an agrarian society in Europe. So they can, they can sustain long building projects like this. They don't have anything like that here. So we're looking at something which is incredibly mysterious, and the fact that they, when they went into Cahokia fairly recently and took soil samples, they realized, wait a minute, this thing wasn't built in like 100 or 200 years. The Cahokia, which is the largest mound in North America, was built more than likely in less than 20 years. Now, I want to throw another dimension in here, if you will, and it really is a dimension, and that is that these large earthworks, these mounds, some of which are just staggering when you first see them, mm -hmm. you know, with your own eyes. Uh, these things are astronomically aligned. That is, they, they're li they line up with the orbit uh, of the Earth relative to the Sun and the Moon and, mm -hmm. and various things like the, uh, the uh, equinoxes and so forth and so on. So whoever did these earthworks had some kind of astronomical knowledge, which would, I think, uh, rule out the hunter-gatherers. It, absolutely, it does, in, in our opinion. Um, it, it gets very complex with this 18 and a half year lunar cycle that we see embedded in the mounds, like the Octagon Mound and, and in other places. Um, you mentioned uh, the solar alignments. Let's go back of a serpent mound. That the undulations of that serpent show the equinoxes and the rising and setting of the moon. Um, the mouth of the serpent opens up looking at, at, the, at the summer solstice. So this is all incredibly deliberate and it takes a lot of care, but it shows that someone has this knowledge. Native Americans knew the cycles, I, I get that, but they didn't have the math and, and how do you 
how do you track an 18 and a half year lunar cycle? And what's interesting, and this is in a future film, and by the way, our, our goal is to produce four of these a year. On the Trail of a Nephilim, Mysterious Mound Builders is the first installment. We're actually working on the second, third, and fourth film, even as I speak. We've got the footage and we're in, and we're in post-production. So what our goal is, is to try to get these out as quickly as possible because there's so much information here. And you say, well, why should we care as Christians? Because it points back to the supernatural dynamic that we see all throughout Scripture. And we know that the fallen cherub has been here on earth doing stuff. And this is evidence of it, hardcore evidence of it. Yeah, it seems like modern man is trying to cover up the evil dimension that goes back into deep into unrecorded history, mythology. Uh, the mythology talks about fallen races of gods, demigods, you know, like Apollo and Zeus and all of the. Uh, the, the Greeks and the Romans had that belief system. <clears throat> and then there were the Assyrians and the Babylonians. They had a belief system of uh, being the earth being visited by fallen gods. And, and they worshipped the gods by building towers and huge earthworks and so forth. Uh, as a believer uh, in the Bible and the salvation of the Lord Jesus Christ, all this fits a pattern for me. But if you're secular in your mindset. You sort of want to push that all away, don't you? Yeah, you don't want to look at it. And, and, and people, and, and archaeologists I've spoken to, anthropologists I've spoken to, really you know, good-hearted people, but they, they won't take that step there because most of them are, are ardent Darwinists. And so you can't have a supernatural in a Darwinian paradigm. That doesn't work out. So they, they shy away from anything other than a natural explanation. Well, they did it with primitive holes, one basket full at a time, right. and it took them 200 years. Well, has anyone actually tested this theory with a hoe? With, with, you know, has anyone actually gone out in the field and see how long it takes to move the dirt? We didn't even get into the compaction. I mean, when you look at some of these mounds like Miamisburg and, and Grave Creek Mound, which are Adena mounds, which are very, conical shape, and the sides are very, very steep. Mm -hmm. And this begs the question, how do you compact the earth? How did they do that? Yeah, and, and, and it's know, very if, mysterious. Just thinking about this, and, and, and after watching your video, you, you raise all these questions. By the way, this is a, a terrific study because you don't answer questions totally. You sort of put that in the mind of the viewer. What do you think about it? having seen this? How would you explain it? And when I think of moving Earth today, and I'm, I'm thinking of like the big uh, front end loader Earth haulers with the great big high tires and so forth, and I'm driving this thing, I'm going out and scooping up Earth and putting it over here with the object being to build a 20-story tall mound of Earth. It's got a flat top on it. And I've got problems from minute one because I've got not only do I have to carry the Earth over there, I have to shape it, shape it, pack it. Right. I have to go somehow up to the top and dump dirt up there. Uh, in other words, this is a huge project requiring lots of engineering in my mind. Engineering, mathematics, building construction, construction techniques, compaction techniques, and these people didn't have this. We are looking, and this is why we call it mysterious mound builders. When you go to an archaeologist or an anthropologist, they will throw out names like Hopewell, Adena, the Miami. They have no idea, and this, this is a matter of historical record, they have no idea what whoever did this, what they call themselves. They make up names. So that Hopewell was a farmer, and he discovered these artifacts. So they called the culture, which seems to indicate or a period of time, they call it the Hopewell. The Adena, same thing. They just make up a name. Well, we'll just call them the Adena. The Woodland Period. They make up all these different names and periods. They know something is going on, but they refuse to move into a supernatural worldview. And if you do, if you say, well, we know that there were giants there. I have been scoffed at, laughed at. And then I'll show up the picture that we discovered, and we do this in the film, of, of the giant on Catalina, which is just under nine feet tall. And they look at that and they say, well, it's Photoshop. And it's, no, it's not Photoshop. It was deep in the archives, hidden and buried. And I discovered that and published that. And then the museum went back and, and redacted the giant out of the picture and wrote a hit piece on the supposed archaeologist. And all this is in the film because there's a hidden history, Gary, and it's, and it's hidden in plain sight. It's kind of all around us. And yet, you know, the church is ignorant of it. What does this have to do with salvation? Or what does this have to do with me? It shows us that there's a war going on, that it's been here on this planet, that there are supernatural entities 
that want to be worshipped. And we are in the window of time where we're, we're going to see a resurgence of these ancient entities that will come back and want to be worshipped. You know, as you're talking, I'm thinking about David and Goliath. Uh. Little David, and you know, in, the, in a slingshot, and the fully armed Goliath. And, and I'm thinking, uh, you know, that's a microcosm of the entire Bible, the whole David and Goliath story. Uh, David uh, is a man uh, after God's own heart. He's out there fighting the good fight against this monster. And that's humanity. Uh, there is a monstrosity just behind the scenes mm-hmm. out there fighting against uh, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and, and trying to preserve the mythology of evolution as their, their method of understanding. And, and this is another reason why we're making this whole series of films, to push back against the prevailing paradigm. Because the Darwinian paradigm is sacrosanct in academia, in the scientific community, and we, we show this in the film. We interviewed this guy, Mark Armitage, who was a microscopist working at California State University, Northridge. He goes out one, one summer, is off season, gets a team of people together, they go to Hell Creek. They find this huge Trisopterus horn. It's fossilized. It's supposed to be 400 million years old. He brings it back to his lab, cuts it open, takes some samples, puts it under a scanning electron microscope. Lo and behold, he finds soft tissue in a 400 million year old Trisopterus horn or whatever. He publishes his findings of soft tissue, and not in, not in creation research, in a secular journal. Doesn't mention anything about his, or his, his belief in, in Christianity. Doesn't slam Darwinism. He just says, I'm a scientist. This is what I found. The, pipe, the paper is, is called to be struck down. Cancel the paper. You know, Don't publish this thing. People are crying out loud. He's fired from the university. Wow. He's fired from the university. He takes it up in a court of law. And, and California State University settles with him for six, finger, six figures outside, right? because they realized that there was such an academic bias, and he never said anything about Jesus or Christianity or anything else, he just published what he found and he's fired. That is, that is academic fascism. That's what it is. And we drill down into this to show that there is a bias. So someone like me who's coming in and pushing back against us and going, wait a minute, it's not adding up. You got Cahokia, which is 450,000 tons of earth built in 20 years. How is this really done and compacted? No one really knows. Don't tell me it's a bunch of First Nation people with baskets and these, and these hoes doing it in less than 20 years. Mm. It doesn't add up. We're looking at something else, and I think it points back to the biblical prophetic narrative and the fingerprints of a supernatural. Wow. And again, I think L.A.'s work is very, very timely because what do we need to do? We need to present this to a body of people out here who are still, uh, if you will, um, anti-supernatural. The supernatural, oh, just childhood imagination. Forget it, forget it. Everything is real. Uh, Bible stories are fiction. Mm -hmm. All this business about giants in the past, now. Uh, the, the, the writers of the Bible just invented those stories, you know, for uh, morality plays and morality tales. It wasn't any of it really true. But L.A., it was all true. And, and there yes, were it was. dark creatures who descended upon the earth in the old days with the whole idea of taking it over. Uh, and their Lord and Master, Satan, the, they, they deemed to be the ruler of the earth. And th- there's a giant battle going on. You know it, I know it, and I think people at large should know it. It's, it's, it's not some silly childhood idea. It's true. These entities who were here on the earth, you mentioned the, the Greco-Roman gods, they were physical, they manifested, they were worshipped as gods. The same exact thing happens in the New World. Quetzalcoatl is yeah. a perfect example exactly. of that. Perfect example. The incredible circle mount, octagon mount complex is Cahokia. Cahokia, a 45-acre plaza, largest mound, flat top. They estimate that the building was 40 feet tall. What is, why do 5 foot 8 Native Americans need a 40 foot high building? Why do they need that? Why did they need to put a 10 foot stockade around the, the mound, Cahokia mound, to keep everyone out? Why did they need that? How do you level 
a 45-acre plaza in the ancient world without a transit. How do you level the interior moat of the Great Circle Mound in Newark, Ohio, which is 12, that circle is 1,200 feet across, and that mound or that, that moat is down about five or six feet, sometimes um, at least five or six feet below level, below that, that plaza, which at one time was dead level. How do you make that so, so it creates water, wow. so the whole moat fills up? This is what's important. This is, what, this is why I'm so excited about this new series. And should I say, Marzulli is still on the trail. On the trail. <laughs> Absolutely on the trail. <laughs> and you know, it, not everybody could do this. Not everybody has your combination of talents, curiosity, uh, intellectual background, and motivation. Uh, it takes some motivation to get out there because essentially you're fighting a fight. And uh, you're fighting against a much larger enemy. If you Much will. larger. It's, it's a, an, the Goliath, as it were. <laughs> It's the Goliath, yes, it is. which says that man evolved from primitive little creatures that were crawling around in the mud. A as opposed to, no, man had a, uh, a, a moment, of a creation moment, if you will, of coming into existence. And the Creator is real, and the enemies of the Creator are also real. Mm -hmm. and we're, we're right in the middle of a giant battle, if you will. And it's ongoing. coming to a climax. And then that's what Prophecy Watchers is all that's about. That's right. And that's why you're here. This is uh, is a must see. I got to tell you, and you'll love the music. And when you listen to the music on this, it's L. A. Actually composing and playing this music. So just a, a little added attraction. But you didn't know he was a mus musician, but uh, but he is. He's got a, quite a history of it. On the trail of the Nephilim, and the name of this is the Mysterious Mound Builders. There's much more here than we've had time to talk about. And by the way, <clears throat> as we do here at <laughs> Prophecy Watchers, uh, we put things together in packages. And uh, we're, we're calling this package the Marzulli Chronicles. We have here uh, the Great UFO Deception. We have the Watchman Chronicles. We have uh, the Fatima, Miracle of the Sun. By the way, what a story. And only L.A. Marzulli can bring the story the way it's been put together. And Fatima too. <clears throat> and those uh, four DVDs it, it, together, uh, if, you, uh, if you purchase them from our online bookstore, prophecywatchers.tv, go to the online bookstore, scroll down, you'll find Marzulli's name. And uh, the Marzulli Chronicles offer with the four DVDs, <clears throat> uh, for a gift of $79.95, you'll receive On the Trail of the Nephilim, <clears throat> the Mysterious Mound Builders, absolutely free. And I think that's a marvelous offer. If you haven't seen his past work, uh, his past work gives presence and, and uh, solidarity to, to the latest DVD. And you, you, you're not giving up, by the way. You're no. still producing these. No, we are, we are actively in post-production on number two. Go to the online bookstore and uh, just check for the Marzulli Chronicles, those four DVDs, seventy nine ninety five, and uh, we will ship free the Mysterious Mound Builders. By the way, free shipping anywhere in the U.S. Where are you going from here, L.A.? Uh, well, we're working on uh, number two, but we've got other sites that we, I won't talk about now, but we are, we are slated to go. I cannot wait. <laughs> L.A. Marzulli and his drone camera. <laughs> <laughs> Always bringing back the best. You know, I, I enjoy talking to L.A., and you'll enjoy his work. So, hey, keep watching, everybody. We are. Thanks for joining us on Prophecy Watchers. You can find us on the web at prophecywatchers.com where you can sign up for our free email newsletter. In the meantime, keep watching everybody and we'll see you soon.